Good afternoon. Welcome to today's presentation, Abolition in America, William Lloyd Garrison. This is the second in an online series of three presentations developed in complement to the Knights of Columbus Museum's Voices for Freedom display. I'm Peter Sonsky, and on behalf of the Knights of Columbus Museum, thank you for joining this session, which is being recorded and will be available later on the museum's YouTube channel. A few notes before we begin. The Knights of Columbus Museum remains closed while we wait and pray for the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. For information about the museum and its upcoming events and offerings, visit kofcmuseum.org or follow the museum on social media channels at KOFC Museum. The final presentation in this series will be next Thursday, April 30th at 2 p.m. The registration link is available on the website's event listings, as well as the museum's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds. For questions, please email museum at K-O-F-C dot O-R-G. For any students assigned to complete the quiz based on today's presentation, you may download it in the handout section. Also, there is a list of suggestions for further reading and study on today's topic, as well as a listing of the entire series. Participants may submit questions at any point in the presentation using the questions utility. I'll monitor activity throughout the presentation. I can respond privately to anyone experiencing technical issues. At the end, I'll read all questions pertaining to the talk in the Q&A session. The presentation should last about 30 minutes. So with that, I am delighted to welcome back Professor Christine Keneally, Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut. The Knights of Columbus Museum has been fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Keneally many times and always to its benefit. A native of Ireland and a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, Dr. Keneally has lectured extensively authored many books, and taught both in America and Europe. She is renowned internationally for her scholarship on the Irish famine and its consequences. She also spearheaded a tribute to Frederick Douglass at Quinnipiac University two years ago on the 200th anniversary of his birth. Many will recall that Douglass was born into slavery in Maryland and he escaped north to freedom at age 20. He developed as a gifted author, speaker, and anti-slavery activist who traveled to Ireland ostensibly to avoid recapture. And he developed alliances while there within the European abolitionist movement. Douglas, however, is the subject of next week's lecture. So please plan to participate in that session too. Suffice it to say, Christine has researched many key figures in the abolitionist movement. We enjoyed her presentation on Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce last week, which is on the museum's YouTube channel. Today, we will hear about William Lloyd Garrison and his efforts to end slavery in America. Professor Christine Keneally, thank you for leading us in understanding the zeal and perseverance of those in the anti slavery movement. They secured the freedom and fundamental human rights for all. And the stage is yours. Okay. Um, so I just need to press a button and then hopefully everything will work. So Peter, thank you very much for firstly inviting me to participate in this lecture series and to the Knights of Columbus for hosting it and also for your great introduction. Uh, Peter and I have worked together and it's always a delight and we're now in a very new world so um, please bear with us and we hope that this presentation goes well. 
So as Peter said, I'll speak for about 30 minutes and then there'll be about 10 minutes of questions and answers. So at the very start, I'll say, maybe it's obvious, I'm not American. Uh, my interest is in Irish history, particularly 19th century Irish history. Traditionally, I've researched on the Great Hunger, the Great Famine, and that period I became involved in an Irishman, Daniel O'Connell, who I'll speak briefly about today. And I greatly admired his work in transatlantic abolition. And through his work, I got to know the great Frederick Douglass. And so for the last 10 years, I've really been researching Frederick Douglass and his relationship with Ireland. So this lecture has evolved out of that. Um, it's part of a series of three lectures. Last week, I looked at abolition in Britain. This week, I'm looking at abolition in America. And next week, I'll be looking at the abolition movement in Ireland. So hopefully they'll all come together. And as you see, there's lots of connections. So I'm not an American historian, so if there's something I don't know, or if I pronounce incorrectly, please forgive me. So I wanted to look through the character of William Lloyd Garrison, and really an interesting character, and in some ways very interesting, because history hasn't always been kind to him. But I want to go back to see him in the context of the times he lived in and the contribution that he made to American abolition and indeed transatlantic abolition. So I want to revisit some of the themes from last week. Last week, we looked at the ending of the slave trade, which was the first step in the ending of slavery. So just go through dates and um, as a historian, I have to say I love dates, but as a teacher, I know often students don't. Just a few dates. It's estimated between 1700 and 1808, British merchants transferred almost 3 million Africans across the Atlantic, of course, involuntary transportation. And this is one theme I looked at last week, the dichotomy in some ways, the paradox of Britain being a major beneficiary of the slave trade, and at the same time, one of the leaders of the abolition movement. So last week, we looked at some of the key players, obviously William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson. And their agitation, helped by a freed black former slave, um, Equiano, led to the passing in 1807 of legislation, which ended the slave trade within the British Empire. And this is ending the slave trade, not slavery. So a very important distinction. And around the same time, the federal law was passed in the United States saying no new slaves were permitted to be imported into the United States. And that law took effect in 1808. And at that stage, these abolitionists believed that if the slave trade was ended, slavery would itself fall away. Of course, we know they were wrong. Slavery replenished itself and in fact became even stronger. So in the 1820s, there was a new agitation, again really started in Britain with great support in Ireland to end slavery within the British Empire. And again, uh, largely due to the work of William Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, and in Ireland, Daniel O'Connell, in 1833, slavery was ended in the British Empire. Although, as we saw last week, there were certain conditions, apprenticeship, which is very ugly, was introduced. And again, O'Connor was instrumental in ending apprenticeship. So what happens? At this point, many abolitionists start to turn their eyes to slavery as it existed elsewhere, of course, particularly in the United States. And as we know, and as we'll look at, it wasn't until 1863 that President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. So it took over 70 years of agitation and very intense agitation for slavery to be brought to an end. And I want to look at that movement that came about. So, as I said, after 1833, British and Irish abolitionists turned their attention to enslavement in other parts of the world. And of course, as they used to say, the blot on democracy was that of America. So America was increasingly on their minds as they tried to bring around this ending of this institution. <clears throat> 
And there were many divisions and many debates for the abolitionists and many questions that different abolitionists took different sides on. And these are some of the main differences. How should slavery be ended? And the big question was, should it be gradual or should it be immediate? And as we saw from the British example, they had believed it should be gradual. What would happen to these enslaved people when they were free? And there was a movement in the 1820s to say, well, let's repatriate them. Let's send them all back to Africa. And this was known as the colonization movement. Another question was, was the American constitution pro or anti-slavery? And people debated this for decades. And then an issue that was seen as being very radical at the time was, should the woman question, the idea that women were equal, should that be part of the abolitionist agenda? And again, that was a very divisive question for abolitionists. So the 1820s, 1830s coincided with the rise of a new, more radical approach to abolition. And it was associated with a number of key people. In America, with David Walker and William Lloyd Garrison. In Britain, with George Thompson, a friend of Garrison. And in Ireland, with Daniel O'Connell. And they were radical from some of their predecessors in that they wanted the movement to be transatlantic. They believed it shouldn't be separate, but that they would be stronger if they worked together. They also believed that abolition should be immediate, not gradual, and that it should be absolute. So they brought a new energy and new radicalism to this whole debate. So support for abolition was very widespread. People at all levels of society were involved in it. In Britain, Queen Victoria and her consort, Prince Albert, attended abolitionist meetings. And something that is sometimes forgotten, but shouldn't be, is the role of women. Women were very much the backbone of the movement. They fundraised, they had bazaars to raise money, they organised petitions, they boycotted slave pictures, they wrote literature, they sold pins, badges, etc. And importantly, some formerly enslaved women told their stories and told it in a very, very powerful way. So women were important. So this new radicalism, at the forefront of it was a man in America called David Walker. And David Walker's father had been enslaved, but his mother was free. And because his mother was free, David Walker was also free. And in 1829, he published an appeal, an appeal to the colored citizens of the world. And it was incredibly powerful. And he urged his people that they should seek to free themselves. And that he also argued that sometimes violence might be necessary. And this was another issue that really divided abolitionists. Was it proper to use violence or should they be passive? and will try and win abolition through moral suasion. So that was another argument within abolition, but he very firmly believed at some stage, violence would be necessary. So he issued his appeal, 1829, and proved very divisive. And unfortunately, he died the following year. So he was a great loss. There was some suspicion that he'd been murdered. As you can see, he was in his early thirties. So his death was very suspicious. And he was a loss to the early abolitionist movement. And that brings me to something that, again, is sometimes forgotten. Just as women have been written out of history, so has resistance by enslaved people themselves. And I spoke about that this last week, but just to remind you, Toussaint Louverture led a successful slave revolt in Haiti in the 1790s. And Haiti consequently became the first black republic in the world. There were major slave revolts and revolutions, Barbados, Demerara, Jamaica, Nat Turner in Virginia, you may have heard of. Slave narratives, they were a major contribution to the whole abolition movement. And Peter talked about Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass wrote a best-selling narrative, probably the most famous, but not the only one. It was a whole genre of slave narratives, and they were very powerful in contributing to this movement. 
And then again, another group that was so oppressed and have been forgotten, Indian nations, Native Americans, were themselves part of the Underground Railway. So we shouldn't forget the role. We shouldn't just see this movement through the eyes of white abolitionists, because it was not that simple at all. So I want to look at the American Anti-Slavery Society. And we've already looked at some of the British anti-slavery societies. And in some ways, what happened in America followed on from what was happening already in Britain and Ireland. And often American abolition is dated from the foundation of William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator. Again, we can predate it by looking at David Walker's appeal historically it's been dated to the Liberator newspaper and as we'll see William Lloyd Garrison was an incredibly important figure within this movement. The following year he attacked the American Colonization Society for wanting to send former slaves back to Africa. He very firmly believed that all enslaved people were American and they had a right to stay in America. Not everybody agreed with him. In December 1833, the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed in Philadelphia and Garrison wrote their declaration. And other founding members included Theodore Wright, who you see pictured, and the Tappan Brothers. And the Tappan Brothers were two wealthy philanthropists from New York. So this is William Lloyd Garrison. So he comes from fairly humble origins, his trade as being a printer and a journalist. And as such, he really recognized the value of print media. And he knew that in the struggle ahead, newspapers, media, propaganda was a very important part of the battle. As we said, 1831, he started the Liberator newspaper. And every week he would include information from what was happening in Britain and Ireland and barely a week went past when he didn't quote Daniel O'Connell. He was a great admirer of the Irishman. 1832, he helped form New England Anti-Slavery Society. And this is what marks him up from other abolitionists. He believed that the American Constitution was pro-slavery and could never be changed. He believed a whole new document, a whole new set of politicians were needed for abolition to be successful. Again, not everybody agreed with him. He wanted abolition to be immediate and absolute, so it marked him as being at the radical end of the abolition movement. And like many other abolitionists, he believed in women's suffrage. He believed that women should be the equals of men in the struggle for abolition. He also believed in temperance, that is not drinking alcohol. And he was a pacifist. He opposed war wherever it existed, and he opposed the use of violence to bring about the ending of enslavement. And he was brave because being an abolitionist in the 30s and the 40s meant you could be beaten up. There was actually a price put on his head. At one point, he was led through the streets of Boston by pro-slavers who led him on a dog chain and collar. So he suffered for what he believed in. Again, it's important to remember that abolitionists at this stage were seen as being extreme. And importantly, in 1841, he attended a meeting of abolitionists in Nantucket. And there he heard Frederick Douglass speak. And that transformed both Garrison's life and Frederick Douglass's life. So 1839, the American Anti-Slavery Society published what was incredibly influential, American Slavery as it is, testimony of a thousand witnesses. And here people involved in being slaves were given a platform on which to talk about their experience. And this publication was again a bestseller and it shocked public opinion and it increased support for abolition. Its impact also extended to a young woman at the time, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And when she came to write Uncle Tom's Cabin, she used the stories in this publication to inform her own writing. It said she slept with it under her pillow. It moved her so deeply. So the anti-slavery movement is just winning new recruits 
when it's also dividing. In 1839, there are approximately 2,000 anti-slavery societies in America. So within a short space of time, within a decade, it had become tremendously successful. It brought together disparate groups, philanthropists, evangelicals, feminists, former slaves, the free black community, businessmen, Quakers, etc., etc. But by 1839, major differences were emerging. And two of the main differences were, how did you regard the Constitution? Was it pro-slavery or was it anti-slavery? We've already seen what Garrison thought, that it was pro-slavery. The other big division was the issue of women's suffrage, because for some abolitionists, the idea that women were equal, that women should share a platform and be visible in terms of the movement was just abhorrent. They could not accept it. They believed a woman's place was in the home. So 1839, 1840, the movement split. It split into the American Anti-Slavery Society, very much led by William Garrison and very much based in Boston. And the other side, the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, much more moderate, led by the Tappan brothers and based in New York. And this split had an impact overseas because in Britain, a British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society was formed with allegiances to the Tappans. In Ireland, the anti-slavery people there tended to remain loyal to Garrison and by doing so put themselves at the more radical end of the abolition movement. So one of the first things that the new American and foreign anti-slavery society did in conjunction with their colleagues in Britain was to hold an anti-slavery convention in London in 1840. And this was the first time an international convention had ever been held. So again, it tells you how much abolition had advanced within 10 years. And over 350 delegates attended. They came from Britain mostly, from America, from Ireland. They were the three biggest contingents, but also from Haiti, from France, from Sweden, Jamaica, South Africa. So truly, truly international. And from America, it included some women delegates, colleagues of William Lloyd Garrison. And these delegates included Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you may have heard of, and Lucretia Mott. And the very first day, the opening debate of this convention was about women. The debate was, should women be allowed to be delegates as the equal of men at this convention? A vote was taken and of course, it was overwhelming that women were not the equal of men and that women could not be delegates. So the women who attended, you see images of some of them, were consigned to the gallery and they weren't allowed to take part in debates or to vote. And every day they watched on as their male colleagues debated. One important consequence though, was that some years later in 1848, these self-same women organized a convention in America called the Seneca Falls Convention. And there they issued the Declaration of Sentiments calling for women's suffrage. And that emerged out of this meeting. So here is a very famous image of the meeting. It's slightly disingenuous in that you see the women sitting next to the men, looking like they were the equals of men. We know that was not the case. And the man you see standing up looking very imposing is the man we spoke about last week, Thomas Clarkson. At this stage, Thomas Clarkson was 80, pretty well retired, but he was a venerable reminder of the days of William Wilberforce. So he was the chairperson. But if he was the chairperson, the superstar of the meeting was the Irishman, Daniel O'Connell. And if I can move my mouse, I don't think I can. Um, Daniel O'Connell is at the very back on the extreme left, uh, the man with black curly hair. And O'Connell was the very first person to address the meeting. And people came literally to hear Daniel O'Connell. William Lloyd Garrison traveled over from America saying the person he most wanted to meet and hear speak was Daniel O'Connell. 
So Daniel O'Connell at this stage, as we'll see again next week, really was the superstar of transatlantic abolitionism. So this meeting's taking place and around the same time, a new person is entering into the abolitionist debate. And it's someone I'm sure you've all heard of. It is Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick Douglass, we now know, was born in 1818 into enslavement in Maryland. As a young boy, he learned to read and write, and he knew that that freedom that came with being able to read and write meant he could never remain a slave. He attempted to escape a few times, and he finally escaped to the North in 1838. At that point, he could have gone to Canada, where he would have been safe, but he said he wanted to remain in America to help other people escape. And so he relocated to New Bedford, and from there he became interested in abolition, and we know he started to read the Liberator newspaper. In August 1841, a local person, William Coffin, invited Frederick to join him at an abolitionist meeting in Nantucket. It was the largest abolitionist meeting to ever take place in Massachusetts. It lasted three days and it was mixed race. Frederick was there. His story was unusual because he was someone who had actually experienced enslavement firsthand. And at a certain point, he was invited to speak, to tell his story. And Frederick later wrote that his knees were shaking, that he felt intimidated, but he got up and he spoke. And as we know, he was a brilliant orator. He also had a compelling life story and the audience were mesmerized. And one person in the audience was William Lloyd Garrison. And when Frederick finished speaking and sat down, Garrison got to his feet and turned to the audience and said, have we been listening to a thing, a piece of property or a man? And the whole audience responded, a man. And Garrison realized the power and potential of the young Frederick Douglass. And at that point, he asked him, would he become a lecturer for the American Anti-Slavery Society? Frederick agreed. And so for the next few years, with another black man, a free black man, Charles Lennox Remond, he lectured throughout the northern states. So Frederick was very impressive very articulate and very aware that he could at any stage be captured and returned to enslavement. But people started to say, how can this articulate young man who's never had any formal education know so much, be so articulate, be so informed? And so to quieten his doubters, in May 1845, Frederick Douglass's narrative was published. And as I said before, it was not the first narrative, it was not the last narrative, but it was the most successful narrative ever. And if you haven't read it, I would urge that you go out and read it. It is compelling, compelling reading. So Frederick published his narrative. Uh, the preface was written, as was the tradition, by Garrison. And in it, Garrison praised Daniel O'Connell. So clearly Frederick Douglass knew about Daniel O'Connell at this stage. And the narrative sold very well, which gave Douglass an income, but it also put him in danger of being recaptured. At this point, people said there was a price on his head. He was just too clever, too smart, and was bringing in too many recruits to abolition to be let to stay loose. So friends of Frederick persuaded him he needed to get out of America. So reluctantly, he was married, had four small children. In August 1845, Frederick Douglass sailed to the great port of Liverpool in the north of England. He stayed there for two days and then he went to Ireland. Why did he go to Ireland? Because some abolitionists in Ireland had offered to reprint his narrative so that he could sell it and have money to live on while he was away from home. Frederick went to Ireland intending to stay for four days, but he was made to feel so welcome. He stayed there for four months. And he described his time in Ireland as being transformative. He said for the first time in his life, not only did he feel safe 
he felt he was the equal of white men. So for him, it was a very, very important episode. And also in Ireland, he got to speak alongside his great hero, Daniel O'Connell. And next week, I will look at that in more detail and how it changed the two men. So he was in Ireland for four months. He left in January 1846. He then went to Scotland. In Scotland, he felt homesick. He then travelled down to England and he lectured there for another 16 months. And during that time, he was incredibly homesick. And um, while he was in England, some English women actually purchased his freedom, which meant he could return to the United States. And during his stay in England, he visited Thomas Clarkson just shortly before Clarkson died. So again, you can see how the transatlantic abolition is bringing all these people together. They all know each other in this network, very important network. So, Frederick is able to return to America a free man, which he did in April 1847. And at this point, it's very clear that his time out of America had changed him. He no longer wanted to be the acolyte of Garrison. He wanted to be independent. So shortly after re returning to America, he moved to Rochester. And against the advice of Garrison, he started his own newspaper the North Star. And again, immediately upon returning to America, Frederick Douglass was beaten up. Um, so immediately he becomes aware of how different his life is back in America. So in the following decades, Douglass, and you can see him here sitting down, he fought not just to end slavery. He knew there was another fight and that fight was for equal rights. And he devoted his whole life in the campaign for equal rights, not just for him and for his people, but wherever oppression existed, he resisted it and fought against it. And this, of course, this included the rights for women to have the suffrage and to be regarded as the equals of men. And as I said, he attended the Seneca Falls Convention in support of the women, but also the masthead of his North Star said, right is of no sex, truth is of no colour. So divisions, of course there were divisions. In 1851, Douglas and Garrison disagreed on the role of the constitution in fighting slavery. And they increasingly became divided and separated on a number of issues. And they finally broke a few years later. And sadly, they increasingly attacked each other publicly. And they never formally reconciled. So the 1850s were also marked by increasing polarizations and increasing movements to war. 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. There was already one in existence, but this was far more draconian and it resulted in some so-called fugitive slaves leaving for Canada where they knew they would be safe. 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published and it became a bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic. And again, it brought a new generation of people into the abolition movement. 1857 was a downswing though for abolitionists. The Dred Scott decision ruled that Dred Scott, a Virginian slave who'd sued for his freedom, was a piece of property and he had no rights. 1859, John Brown, a friend of Frederick Douglass, led a raid at Harper's Ferry. It was unsuccessful as he knew it would be, and he, his sons and their supporters were hanged. But his hanging created a martyr. And then 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected. And this was really what precipitated the immediate steps into a very violent civil war. So the war lasted 1861 to 65. Initially, people like Frederick Douglass were very disappointed that Lincoln didn't do more to show his opposition to slavery. But 1st of January 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And the proclamation declared all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. And this was more inspirational than actual, but it was very important in its symbolism. 
and the proclamation also announced the acceptance of black men into the Union Army and Navy, something Frederick Douglass had been fighting for. And the argument was it would enable the liberated to become liberators. And by the end of the war, almost 200,000 black soldiers and sailors had fought on behalf of the Union and for freedom. And as I said, during the, Fred, um, during the Civil War, Douglas continued to campaign for his people to join in support of the Union. And two of his own sons were the first to enlist and they fought throughout the remainder of the war and fought very bravely. They both received medals and they both survived. His third son actually enlisted, but he was a recruiter rather than a natural soldier. So, the ending of the war. In 1865, the Liberator ceased publication following the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And Garrison said, my vocation as an abolitionist is ended. And at this point, he retired from public life. To some criticism, it might be said, as Jim Crow laws, etc., were increasingly viciously used. So, departures. Garrison died really um, in relative anonymity in 1879. He was aged 74 and he died of kidney disease. During his lifetime, he had been the most prominent white advocate of the immediate abolition of enslavement. Both during his lifetime and subsequently, he was a controversial figure within the American abolition movement, partly for his extreme views, partly for his intransigence, and partly for his relationship with Douglas, some people feeling there was an element of racism in it. However, after he died and Frederick Douglass, still estranged from him, was asked, you know, what do you think? Where did you get your education? And Frederick Douglass very graciously said, I studied at the University of William Lloyd Garrison. So he recognized that he owed some debt to Garrison, just as Garrison owed some debt to Frederick. So another departure. Frederick died in February 1895 of a heart attack. He was 77 years old, although he never knew his age in his lifetime. That day, he'd attended a meeting for women's suffrage and the women had given him a standing ovation. He'd come back to have dinner with his wife, Helen, and was going to another meeting in the evening. And as he waited in the hallway for his carriage, he had an enormous heart attack. He was a tremendous loss. But the memory of him is very different from the memory of Garrison. And since his death, he has increased in stature as a champion of international human rights. So on that point, I'm going to finish. Next week, we're going to take up the story of Frederick Douglass and Daniel O'Connell in Ireland. But for now, I'm going to show you some reading. Um, we sent a list to Peter. So if you want the reading, it's up with the quiz and the quiz answers, so please um, feel free to use it. And we're going to end with a song. And for me, this song is particularly moving, um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It was what was called a gospel Negro spiritual of the 19th century. It was first recorded in the early 20th century. And this recording is one of my favorites. It's by a man you may have heard of, an American, an incredible man, Paul Robeson. He was an opera singer, he was an actor, he was a lawyer, he was a football player, and following in the footsteps of Frederick Douglass, he was an activist for the oppressed wherever they existed. He's particularly interesting, his father was an escaped slave, and this song, it's now thought, was written by a member of the Choctaw Nation. So for many reasons, this is a very interesting song and a very interesting version. So I'm now going to hand you back to Peter and he is going to play this song. Thank you for listening. Well, Christine, if before we play the song, could we just address a few questions that have come up during the course of the session? And for those that wish to, uh, you're, you're welcome now to uh, use your, uh, opportunity to ask questions. The first is just a clarification, uh, and if you would confirm, were there 50 American attendees at, uh, at the convention? Yes. That was the number 50. Yes, and of course some of them were women who attended from the balcony. Yes. 
and then the, the, another question, what role did Methodists, Catholics, and Christianity in general have as a motivating force in support of the abolitionist movement? So this is a great question. It's a very big question. It's very complex. Um, as we looked at last week, a lot of the abolitionists in Britain were evangelicals, and we saw their nickname was the Twelve Apostles because of that evangelical leaning. In Britain, Ireland and America, abolition uh, was very much a movement associated with Quakers, and we'll see again next week, particularly in Ireland. The other churches had more ambivalent role towards abolition. Um, and one of the things that Frederick Douglass and Lloyd Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison, spoke out against was the role of the church hierarchies for either supporting slavery or being complicit by not opposing it. And it really got Frederick and Garrison into trouble. Um, they supported a movement called Send Back the Money. Some of the Presbyterian churches in Britain and Ireland had taken money from slaveholding states. and uh, It proved very controversial. But Frederick Douglass always, and he was a Methodist, a Methodist, he always spoke out against the role of churches. He felt that if the church hierarchies had spoken out more firmly against slavery, it would have ended more quickly. So the role does vary. Um, when again next week when we look at Ireland we'll see Daniel O'Connell who is a Catholic and he very much brought a Catholic dimension to the movement so it's complicated um, but for Frederick Douglass one of the sadnesses is that the church hierarchy was not more active in opposing slavery thank you Christine the next question is there a statue of Douglass at Quinnipiac University Thank you for asking that, and there is, and um, I'll maybe show you an image of it next week, and if the university was open, I'd say, please come and visit it. And the statue has an interesting history itself. Um, it was designed by an English sculptor in 2011, uh, very much at the behest of a committee I'm involved in, um, Frederick Douglass in Ireland Committee, and they wanted the statue to be ready in time for President Obama's visit to Ireland in 2011. And so President Obama actually saw the statue and then the Irish government paid for the statue to come to America. It traveled around a bit, but two years ago um, for the um, Frederick Douglass's birthday, he was 200, we brought it to Quinnipiac and we've kept it at Quinnipiac. And it's a beautiful, beautiful statue. It depicts Frederick Douglass as a 27 year old. That's how old he was when he was in Ireland. And it's full of symbolism. He's wearing Daniel O'Connell's cloak. He's wearing Abraham Lincoln's waistcoat or vest. And his right hand is an exact replica of President Obama's right hand. And um, it's just a great statue. So yes, we have Frederick with us in Quinnipiac. Sadly, he's not on view at the moment. A question regarding Harriet Tubman, who I think whose uh, anniversary of birth I think we're celebrating this year, 200 years. Does uh, Harriet Tub Tubman uh, of uh, the Underground Railroad uh, assisting slaves into British North America, do, does her uh, achievements uh, surpass uh, those of uh, all women involved in the abolitionist movement? You know, I wouldn't like to say it or see it in that those terms because you know no movement is one person and the movement was strong because these people came together in a selfless way and what she did was incredible and you'll see on um, the viewing and um, the filmography i recommend you watch the film harriet so people who were part of the underground railroad did so at incredible risk to themselves and there were many people involved we know of harriet her remarkable life story there are many people whose names we don't know and we will never know but to me they are all heroes um, it's not to take away from what harriet did because she was incredible but there are many people who put their lives on the line in order to bring enslavement to an end but um she is a fantastic role model and i hope more people learn about her and about the other women in the movement they are incredible you know they who were so oppressed and marginalized themselves to fight on behalf of other oppressed marginalized people is just incredible <laughs> 
Christine, the painting that you shared uh, depicting the 1840 convention, uh, what museum holds that and is it on display? It is, and it's in London, um, the National Portrait Gallery, and it is fantastic. It's by an artist called Hayden, and he attended the anti-slavery convention, but obviously there were a lot of people there, and the people he wanted in his image, he later met with them for individual sittings. So they are very, very lifelike. I can instantly recognize Daniel O'Connell, and it's it's just such a great tool um, for both teachers and for students, for anybody. So if you go to their website, and it's H-A-Y-D-E-N, the artist, and they actually have it now so that it's interactive and you can click on somebody and it will tell you their story. And again, it's just fascinating to see the range of people who this convention brought together. Next question, Christine. How were anti-slavery activists able to support themselves? through their so many years of striving for their cause? A lot of the leaders were actually independently wealthy. So I talked about the Tappan brothers, they were merchants. Um, so they brought that wealth. Garrison wasn't. So he brought in some money through the Liberator newspaper, through other publications and um, the slave narratives. But the women, again, the women were the backbone. The women in Boston, the women in Rochester and elsewhere, every year they'd have what they called a bazaar. It was like a big sale and they'd encourage other women abolitionists to make things that could be sold and that money would fund activities um some of the lecturers so i told you frederick lectured in america with um charles Lee remond another fascinating person and sometimes there would be a voluntary collection at the end to help them so in a variety of ways but um you know, so women again were very important in terms of their fundraising activities Christine, why was there such a large difference in the time between the end of the international slave trade and the end of slavery in Great Britain and the United States? Um, um, why was there 26 of... years between the end of the international slave trade and the end of slavery in Great Britain and 55 in the US? Yeah, so um, 1807 when slave trade ends in Britain, people really thought that slavery would end, that you know, it would just naturally die out and of course it didn't but in 1807 Britain was very much involved in war with Napoleon and that war didn't end till 1815 and people take some time to recover after war but um, again we looked at last week 1823 the movement started again um, that point William Wilberforce was pretty ill um, he suffered from bad health all of his life and they really needed a new person to lead the movement. And that person becomes Daniel O'Connell because he becomes very active in the movement in the 1820s. Again, you know, we'll look at this next week, but as a Catholic, he was very much disadvantaged. So he had a lot of vital battles to fight. But as a member of parliament, he was very instrumental in bringing slavery to an end. But even though abolition was very strong in Britain, there were people who were still benefiting from it, who didn't want slavery to end, as we know. Um, they were getting cheap cotton, they were getting cheap rum, they were getting cheap sugar. So why would they want it to end? So again, you know, we've talked about abolition and um, it, there were real opponents to abolition. And also, as I tried to convey, some people thought that the abolitionists were just mad extremists. You know, who, who could support a woman having a vote? Who could support being a pacifist? Um, so this idea that now we you accept that what they were doing was the right thing, but at the time they were seen as being extreme. So they had a lot of different battles to fight. Christine, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for uh, answering the questions and for your presentation. Um, as we close, I invite you all to join us for next week's concluding segment when we'll go deeper into the stories of Frederick Douglass and Daniel O'Connell. Uh, information is available in the handout section uh, and also at kofcmuseum.org. For further questions about this session or in general, uh, please email museum at kofc.org. And we'll conclude, as Christine said, with the Paul Robeson recording, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. So until next week, good health and God bless. <laughs>